I will t tell you today about a connection inspired by the great Primo Levi. I want to first thank uh, Professor Stephanie Jed, my friend, and the Glazer for organizing this, and of course our dean, our fearless dean, uh, uh, Professor Della Coletta. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here celebrating what I, who I consider to be pretty much the most polymathematical, if that's such a word, uh, scientist and, and inspiration to me as a scientist who also hopes to inspire the public through writing uh, in that uh, he, what he was able to do in both literature and in science were, were, were both extraordinary. And I think that's incredibly rare, and I would like to, you know, point out, hopefully, uh, as an inspiration, his book was considered, is considered, I think, by the Royal Institution to be the greatest popular science book ever written. And that was before my book came out. But, uh, <laughs> so today I'm going to uh, start with this quote uh, that is uh, derived from Professor Viterbi's uh, uh, wonderful autobiography, where he, he calls his family motto, I believe, was ad astra per aspera, which means to the stars through hardship. And I, I like to say today we're going to go on a journey to the stars through the eyes of dust. And this is inspired by uh, Primo Libi's wonderful story, Carbon in the Periodic Table. And I want to point out this is the 150th year, as, as we just heard, of the Periodic Table. Some say it doesn't look a day over 10. So <laughs> it's got that going for it. Uh, it's had a little work done, though, um, in order in the last 150 years. And I want to start, you know, because I'm a professor, I want to start off with a little quiz. Okay, so you guys all ready for a quiz? You didn't think there'd be a quiz in the back, you, you literature students, uh, but there's going to be a quiz, and it's a quiz about my favorite subject, the Nobel Prize. So here are three discoveries made in the last hundred years that were all eligible to win the Nobel Prize, and yet only one of them did win the Nobel Prize. So I want to take a show of hands, and you must vote. Uh, which of you think that the, uh, the uh, item labeled number one, the RNA molecule, won the Nobel Prize? It was discovered in time to win the Nobel Prize. It was eligible to win the Nobel Prize. Nobody thinks item one. Okay, brave person. <laughs> Number two, Primo Levi's favorite subject, the periodic table, which before you vote, note element 102, which name is Nobelium. Who thinks, number two, the periodic table, the reason we're here, won the Nobel Prize? It was just called by the professor before me the greatest discovery of the human mind. You guys are not really active today. Okay, <laughs> and who thinks the lighthouse won the Nobel Prize? Okay. okay, and then just for completeness, who is scared and terrified of raising your hand in public? Raise your hand very high up in the air. So of course, it is nothing other than the lighthouse. It was won in 1912 by Gustav Dahlén, a Swedish man, which if you want to have a higher chance to win the Nobel Prize, be born Swedish. And he won it for the invention of automatic regulators for the use in conjunction with gas regulators and buoys. Now, I know. Like many of you, I got here today using a gas-powered lighthouse. And if without it, I wouldn't even need my iPhone. I'd just throw it away if I had to do without the lighthouse. Now, of course, that's just one of the many controversies with the Nobel Prize. And I'm going to not talk too much about that, except to say that many of my colleagues and I have an affinity, an, an addiction almost, to winning the Nobel Prize. And, and part of that is, is depicted in this wonderful cartoon that came out in Nature when my book was published. Uh, they showed this kind of image of what it's like for some scientists that look to the heavens and they hope to see this image of what I consider to be a graven image, an idol, this, this, this entity, Alfred Nobel, who was, of course, a chemist. And he was an inventor. And I'm sure, uh, as, as we heard, uh, oftentimes the greatest authorities in physics, we just heard about five or ten from, uh, from the previous uh, uh, um, speech, we heard about five or ten Nobel names dropped. And, and that's for good reason. I think that it is sort of the highest level of fame and authority that scientists can aspire to. But I, I discuss in my book there are some downsides too. I'm not going to talk too much about that. I want to talk today about something even older than the periodic table, even older than uh, some of the characters we'll be talking about, and that is uh, in this story, the story of stars. And really, the prehistory, so it's said that the past is prologue, right? So what happened before the carbon molecule, described so tenderly, lovingly, affectionately by Primo Levi in the periodic table? Well, he describes mostly the, uh, the, the life of a molecule of carbon as embedded in a, in a block of limestone. But, you know, we all come to, into the universe without really an understanding. We enter in media rays, which, you know, Stephanie tells me means in the middle of the story. And so what do you know about what came before you? Well, it comes from listening to people, as, as the dean said, uh, who came before you and learning the deep history 
of what preceded you. And, and many of us, professors especially, have a, fa a fixation that nothing really mattered before we came into this world. Uh, but in the case of limestone, I wanted to kind of lead up to this picture of limestone. Uh, and because it's so beautifully described in carbon in the periodic table by Primo Levi. And I want to uh, just speak to the beauty and the mystery that if he were around to write, you know, the periodic table part two, uh, that perhaps he'd include maybe some of the prehistory of carbon in it. So I'm going to talk mostly about my research, and that is into the very origin of the universe itself. So the event, the only event perhaps for which there is no prehistory, if the universe began with what we think of as the Big Bang. And actually, that's more controversial than it would have sounded just a few years ago because there are many theories that posit, in fact, there were an infinite number of universes before ours. Perhaps there's an infinite no number of universes concurrent to ours currently. And my research has direct implication for those findings, and I want to talk to you about how we got there. And as described earlier by Stephanie, there are some delightful and especially important connections right here in UC San Diego. So before uh, October 2018, this was the last woman to win a Nobel Prize in physics. This is Professor Maria Gephardt Mayer. She uh, understood better than anybody the properties that made nuclei, such as carbon and other nuclei, stable. So in order to have carbon, in order for have us to have the winemaker, the, the limestone, you need to have stability of nuclear material. And she worked out how and why this is the case. And of course, we named the, the uh, physics building is named after her. Uh, it's always cute. I met her son uh, a few years before he passed away when the U.S. Post Office named a stamp after Mar Maria uh, Mayer. And he told me on the, uh, that on the day she won the Nobel Prize, the uh, San Diego Union Tribune, I forget what it was called, it was either the Union or the Tribune or whatever, it had a headline and it said, La Jolla Housewife Wins Nobel Prize. <laughs> and I have a funny thing because in this... <laughs> The, uh, thankfully, as I said, uh, Donna Strickland won the Nobel Prize in 2018. But uh, as great as that is, and as wonderful it is to have women winning Nobel Prizes, they would have to only award it to women for the next 75 years in order to achieve parity between men and women. So that's just a side note. I'm not going to talk too much about that. I want to focus on another chemist, or famous, it's actually a nuclear chemist, nuclear physicist, Harold Urey, who discovered deuterium uh, before he came to UCSD but for which we have named our chemistry department after, uh, after Harold Urey. He did many other things I'm sure we'll hear about in terms of the chemistry of life, which is really quite astounding and resonate to this very day and connect to this quest that human beings have, unique to humanity, to want to understand where we came from. Uh, we, we have you know, this, this affinity to understand where did the universe come from, where did life come from, we'll hear next, and then where did consciousness come from? How does consciousness emerge? Those are the three great big bangs as I call them. And, and the desire to understand that would be impossible without the discoveries of Maria Mayer and Harold Urey. So he discovered how deuterium takes place in nuclear fusion, how that began the process of the formation of the very first stars in the universe that later shed their, gave their lives to produce the material for the second generation of stars. And that was depicted and, and described very, uh, very uh, in great depth by Professor Margaret Burbage, and I'll describe her in a minute. And, and her protege, Vera Rubin, who is the discoverer of dark matter. Neither one of these women, unfortunately, were rewarded with Nobel Prizes, although they certainly deserved it. And I want to talk to these two women. I call them the queens of the dark. So uh, you might get the impression from looking at these pictures. So Margaret Burbage, this is a picture taken by Ansel Adams. And the previous picture of Harold Urey was taken by Ansel Adams on campus here. Quite, quite wonderful. It's a little hard to see. But in both cases, they're sitting there in front of microscopes. Now, I think it's weird. I've never seen an astronomer, male or female, look into a microscope. Okay, I've never seen it before in my life. But apparently, this is the way they like to be depicted. This picture on the right I got from the Carnegie Institutions of Washington. And uh, Margaret Burbage took, uh, and Jeff Burbage, who is also a colleague of mine, he's, he has since passed away. Margaret Burbage is alive and well and uh, about 100 years old. Uh, and she, uh, she helped to reveal the process by which stars that are the second generation of entities in the universe that produce nuclear fusion, how they are the ones responsible for producing the carbon that would eventually make its way into limestone and eventually make its way into uh, the drunkard or the, the, the person who drinks the, great, the wine in the story. Uh, today we carry on this tradition of, of great knowledge about stellar astrophysics. Mike Norman's group has put an entire universe in a box, in a computer, here at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. What he does is he simulates under gravity and chemical forces and attraction throughout plasma that was predominant in the early universe, the very first generations of stars, which then later make the second generations of stars. And through work with a very famous astronomer, Fred Hoyle, and Jeff Burbage, 
and Margaret Burbage, they were able to publish their famous paper, which is now known by the initials, Margaret Burbage as being first, BBFH, uh, one of the landmark papers in all of physics, 70 years old. <clears throat> and that describes how these stars could undergo what really can only be thought of to be a miracle, which greatly troubled Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle came up with the name Big Bang. I'm not going to tell you what it means because it was a pejorative to British-speaking people, for English speakers, uh, because there's some youth in the audience, and I don't want to corrupt you. But it was an insult to the theory that posited the universe came ex nihilo in the Big Bang. He was deeply atheistic, and he felt that this was an abomination, this theory. And he gave it this name. Unfortunately for him, it stuck. But before he did that, he had to come up with an explanation, and he used what we now would consider to be an anthropic argument, an argument from based on the existence of us that would give information about how the early universe must have behaved, or in this case, how stars behave. And he said, well, we're mostly made of carbon. This famous, uh, not just famous in the essay by, by Primo Levi, but we're mostly made of carbon. Carbon has to exist, and yet it's extremely difficult to get the main players involved, which are namely really three helium nuclei. You see these, these two helium nuclei come together. They give off a gamma ray, which is just a fancy name for a photon, a high energy particle of light. And then they create this state of beryllium. Now, you may not know anything about chemistry, and hopefully for my sake you don't, because I don't know much about chemistry either, but, uh, but helium is made of two protons and two neutrons. When two positively charged entities, neutrons are uncharged or neutral, how do you get two positively charged things to come together in the first place? And then how do you get four of them to come together and stick together? Well, the answer was it required a miracle, a state known as a resonance that Hoyle worked out from, from the assumption that life must exist in such a way that carbon needs to be able to form by this process. This process, the intermediate state of beryllium-8, lasts for something you chemists will correct me, I'm sure, something like a trillionth of a, of, a, of a millisecond. So it lasts infinitesimally long amount of time. But eventually this, this carbon, and I say miracles don't last long, because eventually the star builds up an onion-like skeleton structure until it makes iron, Fe, chem chemical symbol Fe. When it makes iron, it no longer gives off those photons to, to keep the pressure up to resist the gravitational pull of the shells that it made earlier. And when that happens, a cataclysmic explosion takes place, depicted here. This is a star exploding after it reaches that state where it's making iron and no longer can support its gravitational collapse. When it does that, it seeds the local area of our galaxy with the material of which we're comprised, namely carbon, iron, etc. And that's why if you've ever held a meteorite, and I'll, I'll compliment Andy's uh, show and tell with some meteorites up here, you can come up and fondle the meteorites. Uh, you'll find they're very heavy and they're very magnetic like iron. That's because they were belched out from the innards of this star called a type two supernova. Oh, there is this lovely sleep inducing animation music. And so these bodies that are injected from the star eventually congeal to make the earth. And some of the iron that was inside of that nuclear, uh, uh, of, the, of the center of that star is now flowing through your veins. So it's literally flowing through the hemoglobin in your body, in your blood. And so literally, as it said, you have star stuff flowing through you. And it's true. We wouldn't be here without that wonderful star stuff. Here's a picture of it and some excerpts from the quote by Primo Levi from Carbon. He says, our character, which is a carbon molecule, lives for, lies for hundreds of millions of years, bound to three atoms of oxygen and one of calcium. This is calcium carbonate. Chalk is another. I don't know. We have chalk. Should have it here. Our atom of carbon enters the leaf, eventually it collides with innumerable, but here useless molecules of nitrogen and oxygen. This is to make chlorophyll. So it's astonishing the interconnectedness between the earliest entities in the universe, these nuclei of helium and hydrogen, and then how they came to enter into a star that then itself exploded, then it congealed, and then its materials got into the earth, and eventually some of that carbon was in the chlorophyll molecule, and eventually some of it was in limestone, and eventually some of it was in a grape. And uh, now I want to take us fast forward from you know, 13 billion years ago, perhaps, to uh, 100 years ago, 1919, Primo Levi was born. This connection down here, it says, now our atom is inserted. It is part of a structure in an architectural sense. It has become related and tied to the five companions so identical with it that only the fiction of the story permits me to distinguish them. And that's showing this interconnectedness between carbon and the other elements that make up life. These are all belched out from stars, and these are cutting-edge results from spectroscopy, the likes of which are done here by my colleagues such as Allison Coyle and Shelley Wright and Quinn Konopaki and others that do incredible work on the spectroscopy, the chemical fingerprints of life found in the stars. And maybe think of this quote by a fellow Italian, 
the sun, with all those planets revolving around it and dependent on it, can still ripen a bunch of grapes as if it had nothing else in the universe to do. <laughs> now, you guys have more to do, and I have more to do, so I want to just fast forward now from 13 billion years to about 410 years ago when Galileo used this device, a telescope, a simple device, which he had found by way of the oldest academic tradition possible, a.k.a. plagiarism. So he had <laughs> discovered this advice. He had only heard about it, that it was invented by a Dutchman, and... Just upon hearing about it, this brilliant mind, the greatest mind, in, in, my, in my opinion, in, in scientific history, he uh, invented a new type of telescope that was much more powerful, and he used other innovations to make it more useful to the astronomer. And so he became the first astronomer. I call him the biblical bludgeon because of the famous episodes that took place afterwards that I won't get into too much detail about. But you can go visit this telescope. There's one lens that survives. Or you can view this one, which I got on Amazon for $19.95, <laughs> which is almost the exact same size. And with this tiny little device, Galileo was able, like Archimedes said, to use it as a lever to move the entire Earth, displacing it from the center of the universe, the position it had enjoyed since antiquity, to just another planet amidst uh, other planets known at that time. So he was a very successful self-published author. <laughs> he published the Sidereus Nuncius soon after this. And in the Sidereus Nuncius, which is written in Latin, for a reason I bring up that'll be important in just a second, he wrote this in Latin and he depicted over the course of several nights in, in uh, January of 1910, eight, sorry, 1610, he depicted the images of planets and the, not only the planets themselves and how they appear through the telescope, but also these strange stars, which he sycophantically named after his patron. Uh, which were the Medici families, he called these stars, which we now know as the Galilean moons. He realized he was seeing a solar system on edge. And it was a brilliant visualization, a thought experiment. He placed himself above the plane of the massive planet Jupiter. It's just truly brilliant. Presaging by 400 years the same types of techniques that Einstein would later employ to great success. And so what Sidereus Nuncius ushered in was the notion with physical evidence obtained through a telescopic device, a scientific piece of apparatus, you could change the notions of philosophy and even of theology. And for a while, things went well until he made what I consider his greatest blunder. I'm not going to get into great detail about it. And that was to observe the, uh, the, constel the uh, asterism called Subaru, if you're Japanese, or the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, if you're not. And he depicted them with an artist's touch. Very beautiful. Very few of these actually original copies of the Sidereus Nuncius that aren't uh, forgeries still exist. They go for about a million dollars. And what he said down here is quite beautiful. It says, what was observed by us is the nature or matter of the Milky Way itself. And he's saying, for the first time with the aid of the spyglass, I have revealed the nature of the entire universe. A little bit of, uh, of hubris, but, you know, he was a professor. And, and it made him quite famous. And nowadays we know uh, that visible certainty is not the greatest guide to being a scientist. So it's actually, it goes by another name now called, <laughs> called confirmation bias. But I think it's kind of cute when I, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to have children. I can, I, can, I can sing the famous lullabies too. And they can even squeak it out on their violins to great pain and discomfort. Yeah. But they'll play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And it says at the bottom of Twinkle Twinkle, it says like a diamond in the sky, right? Well, this nebula surrounding the Pleiades that Galileo first saw through a telescope, a first human being ever to see, is actually made of some isotopes of pure carbon, our character from the story by Primo Levi. So there's stars, there's pure carbon, there's diamonds in the sky, and that is actually correct. So immediately afterwards, Galileo had some success. So the first thing that happened was he proved, as many uh, inventions are used for, that it had great military advantage. Because with the telescope, what does it mean? It means you can see things at great distance. So he proved you could see things such as ships coming in on the Venetian Lagoon. And you could remove a day's worth of time from spotting them. That means you had a day, which is like spotting the stealth bomber before it even takes off nowadays. And I, it, with it, you could see such things that the human eye couldn't see by itself. I can see you falling asleep in the back. Please wake up. <laughs> and so he immediately transferred this and leveraged this into the two things that every professor wants. Instantaneous tenure, okay, that was great. And his dean uh, doubled his startup funding. So keep that in mind if you want to discover and become you know, instantly tenured and uh, uh, munificently remunerated. Uh, but things didn't uh, uh, you know, continue that long. At first, he became quite famous. I don't believe he ever left Italy. 
Um, I believe that's the case. But he actually became quite famous. Uh, not as famous as this person. <laughs> uh, but it's soon this position in Pisa uh, put him under the influence of the Roman Catholic Church. And he didn't abide by Pope Urban, who later became his friend and was his friend, actually. There's a fiction that the Pope, the church, was very anti-science and they hated him. They actually let him keep writing as long as he didn't write in Italian. Because we know when we write in Italian, things get very tricky, right? No, I'm just kidding. No, you, you're all wonderful at writing. But look here. This is in Italian, right? I don't know the difference between Italian and Latin. But uh, Dean, you can tell us and, and, and Andy can tell us. This is actually in Italian. That was the language of the masses. It would be like the difference between us trying to read Latin nowadays or, you know, giving it to my kids in, you know, in emojis. Of course, everybody understood Italian at this time. This was a big boo-boo because the Pope had allowed him to keep talking about it, but you couldn't teach it, which sounds weird. But teaching meant publishing it in Italian. You couldn't but put it on YouTube, right? So this was the main way of communicating and lecturing. And, car, uh, and his proximity to the church uh, was actually ended up being his downfall. So like some of us, he maybe shouldn't have accepted that tenured position. But uh, what it did is usher in the Copernican model of the universe, which is that the sun is the center of the universe, which itself is incorrect. And that's the beauty of science. Another uh, famous great uh, science fiction author, I I learned just now from Andy that that, uh, Primo wrote a lot of science fiction. I didn't know that. Uh, uh, Isaac Asimov, after whom one of my sons is named, uh, is a, uh, was a wonderful scientist and science fiction author. And he said something like the following. He said, if you think that the earth is the center of the universe, you're wrong. And if you think that the sun is the center of the universe, you're wrong. But if you think you're wrong in exactly the same way, then you're no scientist. <laughs> Meaning that science's props process is meant to disprove itself and not to be succumbed to things like authority bias or confirmation bias. It's the self-correcting nature that Richard Feynman talked about that you mentioned that is the essence of what it means to be a good scientist, and that means failure. Oftentimes it means failure. So for him, he had a great deal of failure. After this, he had great success, but he was in prison for the last nine years of his life. We actually had a workshop in his villa, Il Galolio, in, uh, outside of the University of Florence. Phenomenal place to have a workshop. Except you wanna, if you ever want to feel really tall, go there because all the doors are about like this tall, so you bump your head up there. Uh, and so Galileo ushered in a view of the world that, that, that I depict and discuss in the book, really out to the realm of the nebula, the, the nebula within our own galaxy. I want to fast forward another great leap in time back to 400 years forward when we came to invent the bicep telescope. The reason we invented the bicep telescope is because we wanted to understand what the beginning of time itself was actually like. Not the first 400 million years, not the first billion, uh, first million years, not the first second, not the first millisecond, the first trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. As close as there is a nature where you could fundamentally say that time is changing. If you go back to the beginning of time, time doesn't exist. So how do you measure the discretization of time? Well, the the smallest increment of time is known as the Planck time. We wanted to go back as close as we could to that time. And we did so, we thought, by inventing this telescope called BICEP. I'm not going to get into great detail about it. Suffice it to say, it's a refracting telescope that uses lenses that are transparent to microwaves, which look like this. You wouldn't think this is transparent to microwaves, but it is. And it focuses light not onto Galileo's retina, as this device did, but on top of these superconducting detectors, very similar to devices we make here at UC San Diego, right across the way in the uh, clean room down the hall. And the reason for this is we want to understand the progression from today where we see galaxies back to the earliest light in the universe called the cosmic microwave background back to the earliest possible epoch in time called inflation. And that was the subject of it. And we claim that we did it. I won't get into great detail here. I don't have much more time. But we claimed in uh, uh, March 17, 2014 that we had discovered the earliest evidence for matter and energy in our universe, the detection of what's called the swirling, twisting type of polarization. Uh, and the experiment was known as BICEP2 for reasons I get into in the book, but I won't hear. And we announced it to great fanfare. So it was on every newspaper. It was on uh, in CNN shown here. And that we had discovered the earliest possible evidence for the origin of the universe. This is an astounding discovery. And, uh, and, and people covered it. And, of course, this is my favorite, favorite headline about this discovery in The Onion, a very great and well-known, renowned scientific journal, uh, where they convened a panel of top phys- physicists and R&B singers. Okay, So they had Aretha Franklin, the late, great Aretha Franklin. There's uh, Lionel Richie, I believe, over there. And they talk about whether or not it's possible to give you my heart forever. <laughs> okay, So, it's, again, this fascination with the early universe. It's a real headline. 
But, of course, as they say, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and not all that is meant to, to, uh, to, to be discovered can be discovered. And in our case, we actually made a misidentification in that we discovered, instead of the first wispy imprints of the, of the, of the origin of our universe, instead we discovered the not-so-wispy imprints of galactic schmutz. Schmutz, not on our lens cap, but floating through the galaxy. The same nebula that gave Galileo this impression that he understood the nature of matter and energy in the universe, mostly made of carbon and iron and other things belched out from these type 2 supernovae. So instead of seeing the universe like this, where we peer out from Earth, pristine view of the, of the cosmos and its infant state, instead we know that the early universe and even our galaxy looks a lot like Los Angeles. Okay? It's polluted with smog and schmutz, and we have to look through it. And we have to now design a better experiment to do what BICEP could not do in its, original, uh, in its original case. And along with our chances of discovering the earliest moment in the universe, we also got our chances of winning Nobel Prizes blown away. But I think this quote from Primo at the bottom says, we are here for this, to make mistakes and to correct ourselves. I think that's a beautiful sentiment. I think that scientists should know that. And of course, a corollary to this, you have to admit when you're wrong. And that in order to have this, this humility, in order to move on without humiliation, you must be honest with yourself in the way that Feynman, as we heard, described. So a lot of this, in my case alone, at least I know, I was driven by desire to win the Nobel Prize. And I want to speak about Alfred Nobel uh, because he was a chemist. And he died uh, only about 20 years before Primo Levi was born. And it was actually um, the, the, uh, the endowment of this will took place through a series of events I described. But really it was a, it was a form of, pu of public relations. He wanted to redeem the Nobel name that had been associated with death and devastation for the better part of the 19th century. So to improve upon BICEP, we had to build a better experiment. We know we have to now. We're in the midst of constructing the Simons Observatory. We are the lead institution. I'm the uh, privileged to be the director of this, of this wonderful experiment. And what is it? Well, it's a giant vacuum cleaner in space that can actually suck up the dust. Okay? So it's the, yes, it's the 150th anniversary of, Primo, of the Pirac table, 100th anniversary of Primo Levi, 40th anniversary for us parents of the Dust Buster. I mean, who, who, <laughs> this should win a Nobel Prize, perhaps. So no, seriously, what is the Simons Observatory? It's a set of telescopes located in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile. You can view it. We're setting up a, a, a kind of an alumni tour of it next year. Hopefully, maybe I'll even get Professor Viterbi to come down because inside of it, we use the Viterbi algorithm. And some of our detectors, we have 100,000 detectors nearly, and they're going to be sampled at a rate that is so high that we couldn't, without this applying of a Turby algorithm, basically a CDMA version of CD, we could not do the experiment as we're intending. So this will get first light, as we call it, in about two and a half years. And as I said, if you can make it there and you get a doctor's note, you can come and visit us. I want to conclude with a short poem by Carl Sagan that emphasizes the interconnectedness that astounds me even to this day. He says in this famous peon to dust, as I call it, the, 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 called the pale blue dot. He says, we succeeded in taking this picture. What is this picture? It's a selfie of Earth taken by Voyager 1 before many of you students were even born. In 1990, on Valentine's Day, 1990, he commanded the Voyager 1 satellite from beyond the orbit of Saturn to take a picture of the Earth. And you can see it there, right? No, you can't even see it. Let me see if I put it. There's a circle around it. So a single pixel. And he goes through in a very poetic fashion. He describes how all the wars we fought for conquest and territory and ten-pot di dictators that were fighting for a fraction of what we call a pixel. It's just astonishing in that way. And he says, you see it, that's a dot. That dot is here. It's home. It's us. Every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there. On a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. A lot of sort of uh, almost stoic-like beauty in that statement. So I like to say that, you know, quoting the Bible, you know, the Bible says ashes to ashes, dust to dust. What does it mean? Well, the word Adam in Hebrew, uh, I'm sure uh, 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 Professor Glazer can correct me, means earth. And it means that God formed, according to this biblical tradition, you can believe it or not, I don't care. But he formed Adam, which means dirt and earth. So you're formed from earth, and what's your final resting place? You turn back into dust. So what do we have in life? We just have these two moments, this moment between these two periods of dust. And our job is to maximize that with humility and love and intention. And I think no person better summarized that kind of desire uh, than, than Primo Levi. And so it's an honor to be here. Uh, I do have books up here for the students, and uh, thank you very much.